How did Moses change when he went back to Egypt? That's what we're going to find out today. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. Hebrews 3, five. We saw the last time Moses went from being a prince of Egypt, probably going to marry an aristocrat. Someone suggested that he even could have been Pharaoh. I don't know. You know, if he was Jewish born and everyone knew it, would they have let him been Pharaoh? I mean, I don't know these things. He first looks around and he doesn't see anyone. And then he kills a man because he was beating Hebrew slaves. He runs off into Midian. He finds a place to be. He learns to be a shepherd. He has a wife. He has a child. And God calls out him and is like, hey, remember me? I'm going to send you back. And Moses gave so many excuses. I should really have counted them all. But he's like, I can't go back because who am I? I'm nobody. I can't do this. And then he's like, I don't even know what to say. I don't think anyone is going to follow me. No one's going to come back with me. I can't talk. I am not eloquent in speech. I can't do that. Really, Lord, just send somebody else. I am not good enough. Anybody, anyone's going to be better than I am. Gave all those excuses. But you know what? God says, nope, we're going back to Egypt. It's kind of said like how they said in Back to the Future. We're going back to the future. But we're going to do this thing. We're going to go back. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to send Aaron to be your spokesperson. He is a Levite. He'll be able to help you in this. We're going to do this thing together. And I don't think Moses was buying it. He did go back. He was obedient to God. That, that is something. He's learning that lesson. Our first years, our first 40 years of lessons is one of high education, the best education. I just got done reading a book about Cleopatra. Egypt, which I know was much later than Moses, but Egypt was a very sophisticated, educated society. Then the education of quiet and being a shepherd and being a family man. And now we're going to get the education to be a leader and facing down a pharaoh, probably someone he knew. But I mean, this is a leader of one of the major powers that existed in the world. It's a big deal. It wasn't just some minor king holding court in a little town. This is the pharaoh. So we're going to go back and we're going to call the people out. We're going to bring people home. And this is going to be something else. Moses was about 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian striking the slave. Now he's 80. Who has adventures at 80? Moses does. He does what he's told. So he's going to go back and deliver his people somehow. God says he's going to be with them, but that's what's going to happen. Whew. So he tried everything he could do not to go, but he's going. One exciting but absolutely frightening thing about God is he picks people who don't want to do it. Think of Nineveh and Jonah. Don't feel qualified to do it. Don't know where they're going to even start. But he makes people part of his plan. God could do anything he wanted at any time, but he decides to include us. My friends thought at one point that Christians in particular get all like, oh, God picked me to do something. I said, you have to understand, we wish God wouldn't pick us. We wish God would just come down and say, hey, this whole evangelism thing, we know it's super scary. I'll just take care of it for you. And be like, oh, thank you, God. But instead, God includes us in his plan. I'm sure Moses would have loved it if God says, you know what, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Nope. Moses is going back. Must have been a long walk, too. So he probably had a long time to think about what just happened. So the first thing he does is, you know, we mentioned last time, he talks to his father-in-law. His father-in-law gives him what he needs so that they can go back and be successful, get back there safely, as safe as it can be with all this travel at that time. I wonder what his family thought of the whole thing. I mean, he barely wanted to go. Do you think his family wanted him to go? Boy, I doubt it. But they went, and that's great. A lot of thinking time, but God was also talking to Moses during his time back. He says, you go back. I've given you these powers. There's going to be a whole set of things I'm going to do for you. However, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. I'm going to make him real mad. 
He says that Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go so that he may serve me. And if you refuse, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. That's what he's telling. He's given Moses the whole plan. So God goes ahead and tells Aaron, your brother coming, Moses coming, go meet him in the desert. They met each other. Yes, I hadn't seen each other in a very long time. They're all older men now. And so they talked about everything that had happened. He spoke all the words that, and Aaron said all the words that God had spoken to Moses and did the signs for the people. We're back in Egypt. We're trying to convince the people, hey, we're taking you out of here. We have the power of God behind us. Let me show you all the things we can do. And it said the people believed. And they heard that the Lord visited the people of Israel and seen their afflictions, they bowed down and worshiped. I mean, they're the ones who asked for help in the first time. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh, which is amazing in itself because would anyone be able to just go talk to Pharaoh? But this guy, Moses, was like a brother to him. I mean, think about that. They're both like 80-something-year-old men. Moses lays out the things that God told him to say to Pharaoh. I think Pharaoh must have just been boggled by this whole situation. Who is this Lord? I mean, why am I going to let them go? I'm not letting him go because he needs the people as much as he was worried about them. These are his slaves. These are her doing th this work for him. They're building things. They're in the storage, I think, make basically storing up food for the survival of Egypt. I'm not letting him go. Why are you doing this? Get back to your own burdens. Like, maybe get back to work, Aaron. You're a slave, too. Pharaoh said, this talking to all the people, you're making them rest. They're not even doing their work. They no longer make bricks from straw. Just let them go and do their work. They're crying. They're idle. And Moses is like, well, let us go sacrifice to our God. And then they're crying out, let us go sacrifice to our God. You know what? I'm going to make their work even heavier so that they stop with this whole baloney. And the taskmasters, the foremans went out and made everyone work harder. So I'm not even going to give you the straw to make the bricks. You're going to have to go get the straw yourself. Everything now is tougher. And then they were beaten when they didn't do the work that they were doing in the past when they had straws. So everything just got much worse to them. You're idle, you're whining, you're crying, and now you're not even doing your work. And then the people went and complained to Moses and Aaron, what have you done to us? Now everything is worse. They're even going to kill us because we're not doing what they asked us to do. And then Moses, this is like a chain reaction, goes and says, Lord, why have you done evil to these people? This is now even worse than it was. Since I came to the Pharaoh and spoke your name, he's done horrible things to everybody and he's not going to get rid of them. This is all Exodus 5 and a little bit from the work. But God says, now you'll see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of the land. Meaning this hand that he put against them, he's now going to use his hand to get them away from him. Ooh, God invokes the fact he's the Lord of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the Lord Almighty, and in his name. But now I'm going to establish a covenant with the people. I'm going to give them the land of Canaan. They're going to walk over there and this is the land. They're going to be my people. This is a covenant means like an agreement that these are the things I promise to do. You, these are going to be my people. And they're going to know, quote, I am the Lord your God who's brought you out from under the burden of the Egyptians and into the land I sworn to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I will give it to you as a possession. This was the land that Abraham was promised from the very beginning, and now it's going to be fully theirs. So Moses goes back and talks to the people. And then God says, now go to Pharaoh again and tell him to let the people go. But Moses said, you know, if I do that, they're not going to listen to me. Pharaoh's not going to listen to me. God told them and says, gave them charge, gave them orders to go do this thing. Woo! So, uh, wow. I mean, you could see where Moses was coming with all of this. He left his home that he had with his family. It was probably not the life he dreamed of, but it was a comfortable place. Walked all the way back to Egypt. He's 80 years old. He does the thing. He talks to people and people are like, okay, cool. Goes to Pharaoh. And now everybody's lives are worse. You hate that when you have like a great idea or you're going to do something and everything just goes 
south because of what you decided to do? Boy, I am sure Moses was more depressed than anything. But now God has given him new instructions. We're going to come back to Moses. We're going to see what kind of a miracle that God can provide to convince this king of Egypt to let go of the brick making, let go of the work the slaves were doing. You say that you're not going to let these people go, but what you are. And not only that, I'm going to give them this land and they're going to have their own place, the place that I promised Abraham. And the book says, we start saying, Sometimes when God asks us to do something, why? Why me? Why now? Why this? That's probably what was going through most of Moses' head. And I didn't mention it at the first, but the framework for this particular podcast is Moses, A Man of Selfless Dedication, the Great Live Series by Charles Swindoll, or Chuck Swindoll. That's how I hear his name. But he's giving this framework of the book of this leadership change that happens to Moses as he does what God asked him to do, the changes that happened to him. Charles Swindoll came up with the, the thought, he says, it's interesting because we don't see God criticize Moses. Faithless, you're questioning me. There's a lot of things God could have said at this point, but instead he is basically saying, I'm going to be there. Charles Swindoll says, quote, I'm not even warmed up. Hang in there. Be with me. Stay with me. This was encouraging I see that in the Bible in small steps now in the New Testament. God never minds an honest question. People and said they didn't listen to him because they were so upset about this horrible hole that was taken on him. So now they're just even more upset than they were before. I think you have to realize this was the very thing Moses was afraid of. Pharaoh wouldn't believe him. The people of Israel wouldn't believe him. Now they're mad at him and they won't definitely believe him at all. This was the exact thing he was worried about, but God keeps encouraging him that you have to believe what is going to happen. And, and so then it goes into Exodus 7, and God said to Moses, quote, and this is the ESV, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother shall be your prophet. He'll speak that I commanded you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh, Let the people of Israel go out of his land. It continues on, but essentially go back, tell him these things and gives them what it is he's going to say. Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh and it's going to become a serpent. And so they did all that. They did that. They showed him the staff and became a serpent. So then Pharaoh went and got his magicians, his sorcerers, who are nobodies right there. They can't do, there's no magic. They can't do magic. And when the staff swallowed up their staff, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He was even madder that his sorcerers were embarrassed by the Lord's power. Now, God says to Moses, his heart is hardened now. So we're going to do something more. Pharaoh in the morning is going to go out to the water. He's going to stand on the banks of the Nile. That's what he does every morning. I mean, who wouldn't if you lived on the banks of the Nile, right? You're going to do that. It's beautiful. Take your staff that turned into a serpent and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me, let my people go so that we may serve in the wilderness. You haven't obeyed yet, but you're going to. And when you do, you're going to strike the water of the Nile and it's going to turn to blood. The fish are going to die, going to be gross. And then when you stretch your hand back over the water, and when this happens, there's going to be blood throughout the entire land of Egypt. So we're not going to go through all the plagues, but we're going to have each of these plagues. And each of these plagues represents a god of Egypt. The Nile was worshipped. Each of these is a targeted god of Egypt. I'm going after your gods one by one, starting with the Nile and ending with the very last one, which is Pharaoh names himself God. He becomes the God King. His son is the next God King. And through each of these uh, plagues, they happen. Pharaoh's like, okay, okay, you can go. And then he changes his mind. Okay, okay, you can go. And then he changes his mind. And this last one is going to be the final plague where the Hebrews are supposed to go into their house, put lamb's blood on their door, and that will make the angel of death pass over, get it, pass over, their house, and it's going to kill the firstborn son, including the Pharaoh's son. 
the last god that was taken out is the god Pharaoh. His firstborn, his heir is going to be removed. And this is all symbolic of what is going to happen with Jesus. The Lamb of God, his blood passes over us so that we no longer see death. The other Bible in Small Steps talks a lot about this. This is reminiscent. The entire story of Egypt and the Exodus is pointing towards Jesus and the Exodus from sin. So he does that. God says, you're going to memorialize this day. Every year, you're going to have a feast about this day. You'll eat unleavened bread. You shall remove leavening from your house. We're going to remember this always because this is when God set you free. And this is the meal that became Jesus last supper. Then this happened and the people worshiped God, it said, and they did what it is. And the firstborn son was stricken. So now Pharaoh's like, get out, take your people and leave. Take your flocks, your herds, just go away. They also asked then for the Egyptians to give them silver, gold, clothing. And the Egyptian people wanted these people gone, gave them everything they asked for. They also baked unleavened cake. That's why Jewish people eat matzah. I still eat matzah. I love matzah. And so that they would have food to take with them on the road. And it says they were thrust out of Egypt. It said that the people lived in Egypt for 430 years. And at the end of that 430 years, they all went out of the land of Egypt. And Charles Swindoll says at this point, I remember Moses was having that horrible time. The people were mad. They hated Moses and Aaron. Pharaoh was saying no. But now they're on their way and they're headed out of town, going back to their own land. They're going to return home to be at the place that God meant them to be, the place that the descendants of Abraham lived out until they ended up coming to Egypt for many reasons. They're on their way home. And so this particular bad day turned into a blessing. And so that's where we're going to end this issue. We're going to talk about their trip back to the land of Israel and what else Moses learns as a leader, as a human being, from that particular adventure. It's not as quick as you think it may be. We all know it's going to be a long time. We're going to find out why it was a long time and what does it mean for Moses. But now, in this particular part of it, we've seen Moses going to a guy who was begging not to be picked don't choose me, pick literally anybody else to a man who stands before one of the most powerful leaders in the world, probably someone he grew up with as a kid, and says, let my people go. So my challenge to you is think about if we had Moses in our current time and God was going to show down the 10 gods of our world, what would it be that God would do in order to to prove that the gods of the world are not the Lord God himself. Would money be the first thing that went? Would it be entertainment? I don't know. Think about it. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please subscribe, tell a friend. I appreciate all those things that help the podcast get found. If you could leave a review, that would be fantastic too. And remember, our walk out of captivity starts with small steps. I mean, that's why it takes 40 years, right? 